because God has rescued you and called you his, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks so that Jesus' character is displayed to us and to the world. You know, there have been many different images that have been uh, given or drawn of Jesus. Probably one of the most famous pictures of Jesus is this one by Warner Salmon, done in 1940. Anybody seen this painting before? Maybe you have a copy of this painting. It's the most reproduced copy of or picture of Jesus being reproduced over a half a billion times. But name what you see. You see this, this man, Jesus, who is looking upwards to the Father. And chances are, if you have this painting, you know a little bit about the hidden message that Warner had put in this painting. Because if you look at the forehead of Jesus, you see this round circle resembling the host in Holy Communion. And on his temple, this chalice that's there, resembling this wonderful and beautiful message of who our God is. Or, or maybe you think about this image of Jesus done by Richard Hook, also called the Head of Christ, done in 1969. And can we acknowledge that is a wonderful profile picture right there of Jesus, right? I mean, throw that on your Instagram, Snapchat, whatever it is, perfectly put together this Jesus who is looking directly at you with a nice smile on his face, perfectly trimmed and cut hair with a good flow and a nice chiseled beard to go with it. I also think about this image of Jesus that was given in trying to make Jesus a little bit more acceptable from the movie Dogma. Anybody know this one? Buddy Jesus. It's a good one, right? In the movie, it's a little... Uh, parody that was done to try to make Jesus a little bit more approachable instead of the crucifix that the Roman Catholics would have as an image of Jesus. And here you have Jesus with the thumbs up and the finger pointed with a wink just being your buddy, which I love this meme that came with it. Yo, bro, Sunday's at my house. tells us a little bit about what we desire or name Jesus to be. Or maybe for the dudes in the room here, this picture of Jesus. Didn't get that response at 8.15. Done by Stephen Sawyer called Undefeated, a jacked Jesus as a boxer, and you can't really read it here because it's a little bit smaller, but he stands in the corner marked Savior with boxing gloves that say mercy on them. Nothing like getting punched in the face with boxing gloves that say mercy, right? But here's the thing about pictures. They conceal. They don't fully reveal while these images give us or tell us about someone, they don't tell us the whole story. The pictures kind of function like a name. They, they give us this partial truth, a truth that, that Jesus is this kind or, or buddy-like figure or even a fighter. But the challenge becomes... When we prefer one of these, we misuse the name of God. Today, we're going to keep moving forward in this sermon series called The Tender Commandments. We're going to be looking at the second commandment here, which is this. 
that you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And if there's one thing that I hope you would get from the sermon today, I'd love for you to write this down. You can put it in a note in your phone, write it on a sheet of paper, or send it as a text message to yourself or to a friend. That our tender God wants us to know him without controlling him. Our tender God wants us to know who he is without controlling him. And misusing a name is misrepresenting reality. It's calling a baptismal font a bathtub. And when you do that, you misrepresent reality. You're controlling or defining something in a wrong way. You're trying to make something to be more manageable as you want it to be. And so when it comes to the name of God, what is God's name? Well, God has a rather profound answer as to what his name is. So I'm going to invite you, if you brought a Bible along, or if you have your phone, you can open it up to Exodus chapter 3, that verse that we just heard Meredith read for us here today. And I want you to see here in Exodus chapter 3 of how God talks about his name. God um, gives these commandments that we're reciting in this series to a man named Moses. And, And Moses is the one who goes and communicates them to God's people. Moses is also the one who who is sent to rescue God's people out of slavery from Egypt. And before he is and goes and does that thing, God appears to Moses in a burning bush. And he has this this calling for Moses that you're going to be the one who goes and rescues my people out of slavery and tells them about my commandments. And and Moses, in this moment, has a question for God before he goes. He says this in Exodus 3, verse 13. It says this. Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Should I say that, hey, he's... This God, he's like, he's a a friend. He's a boxer and a fighter. I mean, what's what's the name? What's the description? What, What should I say? Who has sent me? And notice how God responds here. God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. This response of God is this divine name that's known as Yahweh. There's been lots of ink that's been spilled about this name. But essentially what it means is that I am who I am or I will be who I will be. What God is boldly declaring to Moses is that that you don't get to contain me by just some simple name or description. I am who I am, and I will be who I will be. And fascinatingly, God continues in, in verse 15. It says this, God said, also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. What he's doing here is is he's attaching in this moment in time with Moses, he's saying that that same God who worked with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob, I am that same God. And I am the God who is sending you here today. And I am also the God that will send you for generations on. Notice he says, this will be my name forever. Forever. And thus, I am to be remembered through all generations. See, what God's name reveals about himself is that he's a really big deal. That that God's name reveals that he is different and one that we should not misuse his name. 
But see, the challenge is for us is that we as people misuse his name. I think we misuse his name in in one of two ways in particular. In one way, we misuse God's name by desiring to control God over knowing him. We desire or we settle for partial truths about who our God is. Uh, Let me explain. Uh, Tim Keller, he gives this wonderful uh, analogy of uh, talking about his car and how he hates to admit that there is something wrong with his car. Anybody with him? I'm like this, all right? Like when you're driving on the road and all of a sudden there's a noise that's going on and you just don't want to admit that something is actually wrong with your car. And so he tells this really funny story of how um, him and his wife, Kathy, they were uh, driving one day and it had been a number of months uh, since they had turned on their air conditioning. And so they get in the car um, and it's hot outside, hot in the car. And so they turn the AC on and nothing happens. And and Kathy, his wife, is like, uh, maybe we should pull over and change our plans and, and take our car to the mechanic and get this taken care of before we go and drive it around. But for Tim like me, and maybe like you, the thought is, no, let's just let it warm up a little bit. Don't nudge the person you're sitting next to right now, right? Because it's like, I just, it just needs a little bit more time for it to start working. Keller goes on to say, he says, 15 minutes goes by and Kathy has her hands against the vents and she's like, Tim, there's nothing coming out. And Tim, sitting in the driver's seat, says, actually, I kind of feel a cool breeze that's starting to come through. Kathy leans over to him and says, that's because your window is open, Tim. And as he was reflecting about this moment, so the challenge is, is that we desire control over the truth. Do you get what he's saying? We, we desire control over something instead of the truth about something. What he was reflecting on was how that if he was going to play in the truth, what that meant is that, yeah, he was going to lose some control. That he would have to like forfeit their plan of what they were doing and going and taking their car to the mechanic and spending time at the mechanic that he didn't want to spend and spending money at the mechanic that he didn't want to spend. Or he could live in this false place, but where he felt like he had control. See, we desire control over truth. And we do this with God all the time. We do this with God when we say things like, like, I I couldn't believe in a God who would teach that that Jesus is the way to heaven. And when we say that, we desire control over what he has revealed. Or, or I couldn't believe in a God who allows suffering in this world and this pain that I'm going through. When we say that, we desire control over what he's revealed. Or, or I couldn't believe in a God who would tell me to go against some of the things that, that I just personally feel are right. When we do that, we desire control over his truth. And, and frankly, generations have done this in their own ways. This isn't just some like agenda of 2023. This is something that has happened all throughout history is that we as broken people misuse the name of God, which means that we would prefer to control God rather than be shaped by him. Misusing God's name means that we would prefer to control God rather than be shaped by him. And see, I think we misuse God's name in two ways prominent ways for us here inside of our context today. 
I mean, one of the ways that we misuse God's name instead of being shaped by him is that we just settle for partial truths. We settle for things to make sense or fit my narrative. And when we do this, we should be incredibly cautious in doing this. Abraham Lincoln, he had this wonderful quote during the Civil War. A reporter came to him and asked him the question, um, is God on your side, President Lincoln, as you fight this Civil War? And Lincoln responded with this. He said, sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side. For God is always right. Who is shaping who? Paul writes it this way in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. That as we share this truth with one another, we do so out of love, but we grow up in every way into Christ, who is the head of the church. Because too often we just settle and misuse God's name with partial truths. Or we misuse God's name with hypocritical actions. We, we say one thing and then we do the opposite. See, it was in your baptism, as Pastor Christensen pointed out earlier in our service here, is that, that you are baptized into the name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so you are gifted an identity and now you bear the name of God. But see, the challenge is, is that we go out into this world and we misrepresent who God is to our neighbors. We're hypocrites in the way that we act. And the things that we say don't line up with what we do. And this would be a really awkward place to end the sermon today. Right? What do you learn at church today? Well, the kids were really cute at the beginning. That little kid saying, oh yeah, right away, right? That was hilarious. The preacher, boy, he told me to not be a hypocrite and not settle for partial truths. Really glad I went to church today. Now, I, I want to be serious here, though, of that misusing God's name is done in these ways for us. And these aren't things that we should do. We should repent of these things when we have done wrong. But I also want you to hear here today that God is in the business of using broken people for his purpose. Somebody say amen to that. God is in the business of using broken people for his purpose. I know this to be true because this is exactly what he did with Moses. And in Moses, if you read his story, if you want to read more of his context, read Exodus chapter 2. And, and you can learn a little bit more of why Moses would ask this question in Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. He said this. He said, when God said, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I to do this thing? That I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And maybe you've had that moment with God before where you're like, who am I to do the task that you have put in front of me? I know I've felt this way. Be willing to bet that we feel this way as well, that God, you are now calling me to go do this. But who am I to do this very thing? I'm reminded of Martin Luther. He has this wonderful prayer, a prayer that I recite every Sunday when I come here to Webster Gardens. It's called his Sacracy Prayer. And in this prayer, he says this. He boldly prays this. Lord God, you have appointed me as a pastor in your church, but you see how unsuited I am to meet so great and difficult a task. If I had lacked your help, I would have ruined everything long ago. 
Would you say these next words with me? Therefore, I call upon you. I wish to devote my mouth and my heart to you. I shall teach the people. I myself will learn and ponder diligently upon your word. Use me as your instrument, but do not forsake me. For if ever I should be on my own, I would easily wreck it all. See, this prayer isn't just a prayer that is beautiful for pastors in a church. This prayer is beautiful for those who bear the name of Yahweh, of God. Because God is calling you. He is sending you out. You are a representative of him. And we fall short of what God has called us to do in sharing the good news of who our God is to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our friends, and to our enemies. But I want you to hear God's comforting word to Moses here when Moses asks the question, who am I to do this thing? God responds this way. But Moses, I will be with you. I will be with you, Moses. Which is really fascinating because that's the same promise that's given to you in the waters of baptism. That in the waters of baptism, when you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God's promise is that he is with you to the end of the age. And see, for us, what this means is that God's presence enables us to know his name without controlling his name. God's presence enables us to know his name without controlling his name. So so maybe right now you're wondering, what does this mean? Okay, how how do I put this into practice in my life? Well, I would simply put it this way. That our tender God wants us to know him without controlling him. Which means that we look to Jesus. We, we look to Jesus over and over again in all that we do in this life. Jesus said this in John chapter 8 verse 58. He beautifully said, and it was confusing for the people during that time. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And what Jesus is doing in this moment is he's attaching himself to the divine name. He's saying that I am God. And as God, I desire for you to be shaped by my teaching, for you to know who I am. And what that means is that you are one who doesn't get to control God's name, but that you're shaped by the teachings of what Jesus has said. And and what that leads us to is that Jesus himself, that when we look to him, he is the one who has lived this out perfectly. He is the perfect sacrifice that goes to the cross and rises again from the dead. And so what that looks like is that we we put Jesus in all of our life circumstances to be shaped by him. I mean, a very simple, practical way, the the way I would say it is this, is that, like, look look at the havoc that is happening in your life. The pain that you're experiencing in your life. And and call that out to see what's the misuse of God's name in doing this. In that pain and in that havoc. How are you misusing God's name? And then I challenge you to put Jesus in that scenario. Put him in that scenario. I mean, what that would look like is, say, something like like worry or anxiety. That that when we experience this, this big thing of anxiety... This havoc that that rules and controls so many people's lives. We need to call out that it's a misuse of God's name. Thinking that I can control everything. And I want to challenge you to put Jesus into that. That Jesus himself said, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. As a step forward in a healthy way. Or in in seeking to have all of the answers or to have all of your life put together to impress other people. A misuse of God's name is that. Thinking that we have everything all together or that we're these perfect human beings, but we're not. 
And so I challenge you to put Jesus into it, that as he's hanging from the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. See, my hope would be in proper use of God's name means that your mind is filled with who our God is. And that he continues to shape you and mold you. And what that means is that it will change you. Because impatience gets chiseled away when you reflect continually on the patience of God. Bitterness begins to be chiseled away when you see the grace of God. Worry and anxiety begins to be chiseled away when you see the provision of God. You see that our God is one who continues to work and can't be just contained by one image. But our God is revealed through Jesus, the one who has lived life perfectly, the one that we cling to and we hold on to, and the one who promises to bring life now and forever. Amen.